Good morning. Is it still morning? No, it's not still morning. I'm so behind in life. Always behind. ADHD. Oh well. Could be any letters of the alphabet I could attribute that to actually. Hi Penny. How are you today? It's lovely to see you. I always say that. Lovely to see you. I really mean it though. Sarah! 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 I love that song. It's lovely to see you too. So, I'm actually experiencing a higher than usual amount of anxiety today. I have no idea why. Hello Kelly! This is a little bit cray cray because the other day, the last time I did a live, all the same people were here and I was really excited and really happy to see all the best people on earth joining my live. <sighs> so I am feeling a little bit anxious today. I don't know why. don't know what's going on. I may have drank too much coffee. Don't know. Don't know. And yeah, thanks Penny. It is. <laughs> It is the afternoon indeed, but I was not aware of that. I've been in consultations today since 6 a.m. Actually, I love early morning time. Hi, Alana. How are you? Oh, that's so lovely. Thank you for being here. You've left some really lovely comments and I've read them all and I'm always so appreciative and so grateful. So thank you so much. Um, so this camera is my face doesn't look like my face. Isn't it funny how just the slight change when you're so used to looking into a mirror and seeing what you see and then having it reversed in front of you I could tell straight away that my face looks different, like it's around the wrong way. This is so bizarre. I'm holding up this hand and the other side, the other one's moving in the camera. Why does it do that sometimes? Anyway, I'm going to be talking about, talking to our children about being autistic and or PDA or ADHD or dyslexic or bipolar, whatever you would like to apply in your situation. I can only talk about being autistic and PDA and ADHD because that's my experience and I don't speak for other people, only myself. As a mum of four children who are all autistic, I can talk about the process that we employ as a family when speaking to our children about autism. My husband's also autistic. We are all diagnosed. This question comes up a lot from families. How do I tell my child they are autistic? Or should I tell my child they're autistic? And there is a really incredible foundation for moving forward in all of that. And it is what kind of narrative does your family have around autism? So whatever way we speak about autism in our family home is the narrative, the beliefs, the understanding and the experience that our children will have about autism. So if we're a family who has the telly on while there's a program about autism and it's a doom and gloom narrative and it's a story about a family whose child is in distress and there's cameras in the child's face and the child is or the adult or the adult because this happens to autistic people of all ages um, you, I mean, I'm sure we have all seen at some point in the media a horror story involving an autistic person, usually who is non-speaking, usually whose body does not follow the intention of their mind. They may be dyspraxic. Uh, 
and when we see that of course the feelings and the thoughts we adopt about autism are not good it's scary it's terrifying and when our children are diagnosed the initiation process from professionals is often I'm really sorry to tell you this but your child's autistic or uh, your child has autism like it's this you know other separate part of us which it's not it's central to my being it influences everything about me that's why I prefer identity first language I am autistic because I embody autism <laughs> if we are a family that focuses on the celebration of autism and acceptance and understanding and learning about autism then that's a different story so we can open up the discussion points with our children um, by talking about examples in the media of autistic people um, and not just autistic people who are speaking so we make sure that we look at a variety of autistic expression so we might you know, children love to see things in the media like, you know, there's actors. There's a range of actors that are autistic. Anthony Hopkins. Um, <laughs> I'm probably talking about people that our children have never heard of. But, you know, autistic people are everywhere. So we seek out examples in the media, in pop culture, uh, authors, people who have contributed to the innovation and progress of technology and society. We think about our children's interests and we find autistic examples of people who have contributed in some way to their passions. Or we might talk about family members. It's highly likely that we have family members who are autistic, whether they are identified or not. If they are, then we can speak, practice speaking positively about our family members. As in, you know, your cousin Caitlin, and this is just a random example because I have a cousin called Caitlin. It's not even specific. My cousin Caitlin is not autistic. <laughs> you have a cousin Caitlin and she's been doing this thing and it's really amazing because she gets to do that because she has an autistic brain. Not, she does that, even though she's autistic, it's because we're autistic. So practicing speaking about autism positively. We can source publications and books. Penny's given a really nice example. The All Cats Have Asperger's Syndrome book. Yeah, but it has been changed to All Cats Are On The Autism Spectrum. That was one of the first books I read actually, Penny, as a training teacher, as school principal handed it over and I read it and went, wow. This is me. <laughs> um, but, you know, cultivating an attitude and narrative of positive autistic identity. Because when we celebrate autism, when we understand it as a strength, then our children are far more likely to feel okay about being autistic. If we're speaking about autism from a place of negativity, or grief or sadness and I'm in no way insinuating that those um, are not parts of people's journeys that they need to go through because that's not for me to say I don't dictate how people process their children's diagnosis um, but if we focus on the neg negative aspects, then nobody's going to want to identify as autistic. They won't even want to hear about it. And so the problem with that, I guess, is that when children are diagnosed, it's usually because we're focused on their behavior. There's been a range of behaviors that we've been concerned about or educators have been concerned about. And so they've been referred on to the appropriate professionals to be assessed and diagnosed. It's important for our children to know that the only reason we've been focused on those behaviours is because we understand that behaviour is communication, especially for autistic people. 
language, verbal speech, verbal language is not our first language. I know lots of people might think, well, you're a human being. Of course, verbal language is your first language. It's not. Our brains are closer to the animal brain than people can understand. And there's research to support this. So in the way that uh, animals actually communicate via energy and via an intuitive process, many autistic people do this as well. And I've actually spoken about this before, energy being really important to us, feeling into the presence that a person brings with them. And everybody has a presence. Some people might use different language, vibe, or, you know, the energy that somebody brings. So when we're around really angry people, they don't need to exercise anger. They don't need to shout or scream or be rude. Sometimes you can read it in a person that they're full of anger. When we're around somebody who's loving and kind and nurturing, they give off a presence of being that way and we can read it in, in their energy. Autistic people are very, very sensitive to the energy and the presence of other people. So that's our first language, tuning into other people. But we somewhat get disconnected from that by society because we're trained to communicate in the same way that non-autistic people are and that's with language. Some of us are hyperlexic, so we're very, very, very good at speaking. We don't appear to have a problem with it, but behind that is this consistent process of really thinking very carefully about what's going to come out of this next. Anyway, I'm so off track. Um, it's important for us to know we're autistic. It really is. And when families say to me, should I tell my child? I don't like to operate around shoulds. I'm a PDA, so that's demand language to me, but I would like for all autistic people to know they're autistic and to understand themselves and who they are, how they show up in the world. I think it's important though to cultivate positivity first, positive autistic identity, give examples of what that is before we have the conversations with our children about being autistic. It may be a gradual process of introducing smaller concepts around autistic identity before we go, bam, you're autistic. It's important not to say, here's your diagnostic report and all the deficits that gave you the diagnosis, because nobody wants to see that. You checked all the tick boxes of things you can't do, therefore you're autistic. No, 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 nobody wants to see that. That does nothing for our sense of self. It does nothing for our self-worth. It others us and it makes us feel disordered and we don't want to cultivate that for our children. So there are some other ways we can do it. We can connect our children with autistic mentors. We can show them examples, YouTube channels, um, social media pages of autistic people so that they get to observe from a distance because this is what we like to do as autistic people. We like to navigate our own learning and what we know about something on our own terms. So if we can sit back and observe from a safe space, that's helpful for us to learn about autism and to remind our children that it's a spectrum. There's lots of variations of autistic expression we're not all sitting in a corner rocking, spinning toys. Some of us are, and those things are very pleasing, but we aren't all doing that. And many of us have been trained out of that, or we have adapted through observation. We might be masking. Some of us have gone through early intervention. Some of us have had the messaging that it's not okay to show our authentic autistic expression. And we don't want this for our children because it means shutting down who they are and that causes great pain and confusion. 
I can talk about what it's like to not know we're autistic. When we don't know we're autistic, life is an incredibly painful place to be. I didn't know I was autistic. I wasn't diagnosed autistic until I was 33. So I didn't do too bad of a job fitting in. I had friends, you know, I had a great sense of humour. I had some things that worked in my favour. But I was very distracted at school. I could not engage with my learning, even though I was academically gifted. And Kelly, I don't know if you're still in this chat, but Kelly used to sit next to me in year nine and she will remember what I was like in year nine. I used to run back and forth going like this in the classroom so that the air and the wind would get into my eyeballs and it would look like I'd been crying and then I'd ask the teacher if I could leave the room and pretend to be upset so I could just get out of class. I would draw pictures, I'd screw things up and throw them across the room. I was constantly kicked out of the classroom. And even though that was very entertaining for my classmates and very entertaining for me, oh, she's still here. <laughs> um, underneath that, underlying that behaviour was a sense of shame for me as well because I knew I was failing my family. I was failing myself. I knew I could do better, but I didn't know how and I didn't know why I wasn't doing better. But clearly I was unsupported in the classroom. I needed help to be focused, uh, however that would have looked. So as time went on, life changed and I couldn't quite, couldn't quite keep up. So in order to remain uh, socially adept, I drank alcohol and I abused recreational drugs because that meant that it took away the social anxiety and all the other anxiety. And that's how I engaged socially. I couldn't do it without being drunk. Um, you can absolutely have a giggle, Millsy. <laughs> absolutely have a giggle. It's totally okay to laugh. I still laugh about those times too. Um, but yes, I just felt like there was something inherently wrong with me. What's wrong with me? Why can't I be like everyone else? Why can't I do life like everyone? And it didn't matter how many people I was surrounded by, I felt completely alone. I felt absolutely 100% alone. It didn't matter how many counsellors I saw, psychologists, psychiatrists, how many self-help books I read, how many GPs I saw, how many psychics I went to, how many religions I tried. And I can honestly say I spent my life searching, seeking out the answers because I knew something was inherently different about me, but I thought something was wrong with me. And all along I was just autistic. So I did a very good job of fitting in and appearing like everybody else, but I was really suffering underneath, really, really suffering and struggling. And I pretended I was happy because I didn't want to concern other people around me. Um, Penny says, I got into so much trouble in year five at school because my friends would say, Mrs. Bucket, the lady of the house speaking, and I'd crack up into the giggles, even in Japanese class. <laughs> Mrs. Bucket, my grandmother loved that show, Keeping Up With Appearances on the ABC. It's a funny, funny program. Um, so we internalise our struggles and we don't really share them with other people because we don't have the language to share the internal struggle with people because we don't understand it. And when we're children, it doesn't matter how much we fit in. We know we're different and it's far better to know why we're different and that it's fantastic difference than to feel we're different and think there's something wrong with us and we can't tell anybody because it's bad and there's shame wrapped up in there. 
it's important for us to have an identity, but it's not enough to tell a child or to have the conversation with a child about being autistic and then pushing them back into a system where they're expected to perform and to present like their non-autistic peers. They need peer groups of autistic people. Now I know a lot of professionals tell people, and this really does happen, don't engage your autistic children with other autistic children because they will become more autistic. They're, they'll be encouraged to behave more autistically. <laughs> it's who we are. We're autistic people. And, you know, it's great to have friendship groups of all different neurotypes. But it's not until we have people who are autistic like ourselves that we can really engage with and say, Oh my God, you think like that too? You feel like that too? I do that. Really? You gag on food as well? Me too. <laughs> and as funny as that sounds, and as much as I'm making a joke out of it, all any human being wants is community in whatever sense that is, however it looks. For some autistic people, it might be online community, gaming community, but when we meet, when we've gone our lives knowing that, okay, I have these friends, but I'm not exactly like them. And for the first time, we have peers and we go, wow, we have so much in common and I really like them. That helps us to like ourselves. So to have reflected back to us really positive qualities is so empowering. It's such a beautiful thing to feel so othered all of our lives and then to get to a space where we can really like ourselves. Now, if we go our lives not knowing we're autistic, what happens is we just keep trying and trying and trying and trying to be something that actually we're never going to be. You know, the pressure I put on myself to do better and to think better and to feel better and to be better and putting so much energy into being someone I'm not. When I was diagnosed, there was a sense of relief, but also a sense of grief because this whole 30 years of my life, 33 years of my life, I could have been exploring my autistic identity and coming to terms with who I truly am and cultivating a life that was positive and supportive and living in ways that were aligned with my brain and the way I'm wired, which is what I do now, which is why I'm so happy, which is why I'm thriving, which is why our family is able to cultivate that for our children. There are so many generations of autistic people who haven't known that they're autistic, who have put incredible amounts of pressure on themselves to fit in, to present like everybody else, and they know they're different. And that pain, that internal struggle, is then projected onto their children and then onto their children. And that pressure and that pain and that inherent feeling of something being wrong with us is just passed down and passed down and passed down and it becomes intergenerational trauma. And we can stop that. We can absolutely stop that by understanding that autism is just a different kind of person. It's a different way of being in the world. And I know that there are people that would say, but how can you apply that to the, the real autistic people, right? The autistic people who don't speak, who don't make eye contact, who are completely dependent on carers. Well, who are we to say that they are not happy? Who are we to stand in our privilege and to judge for other people the quality of their life? We don't get to do that. One of my children is one of those people. One of my children. And when I see people come onto my page and say, 
well, you know, that's all well and good for the autistics that are high functioning, no such thing. But what about the autistics that will never have any quality of life, who will need to go into residential care? We really should be finding a cure for them. You're talking about wiping out one of my children. It's hurtful and it's ableist and it's completely unnecessary. And it's no different to us taking any other experience of being in the world and making a judgment about an experience of living that isn't ours. We have no idea what life is like for other people. It doesn't matter how they present or how they function or how they appear. We don't get to choose for another human being the quality of their life or whether their life's any good or not. So it's important to talk to our children about being autistic. It's important to explain that their brain is different, but in a positive way. But in saying that, it's important for our children to know that this is a disability and there are things that we cannot do, not things that we're choosing not to do. And I'm really honing in on the PDA here because I have a lot of parents say, well, you know, they just won't do this and they won't do that. It's because they can't. And when a child says, I can't do that, they're really telling the truth. They cannot do that in that given moment. It doesn't matter if they can do that thing in an hour from now or they did it yesterday. When a person says, I can't do this right now, they're telling the truth. It's important for us to know that the things we struggle with are not our fault. It's important for us to know that we're not causing the strain in our parents' marriage or that we're not causing uh, incredible amounts of financial strain in our families because we take all of this on board as children. We know what goes on around us. We know how we're thought of and considered and we need more than anything as vulnerable little people to be built up, to know that the adults in our lives can handle us at our worst and at our best. We know this. We know exactly what people think about us. We know what stress is going on. So it's important for us to understand ourselves to be able to develop a toolkit. And when people ask me, well, how do you support yourself or how do you look after yourself? I'm 40 years old. I was diagnosed at 33 and it's taken me a lot of hyper-focus and intense perseverance and research and exploration of what I need. And I can only develop a toolkit for myself and push through things that are challenging and difficult because I have a really good understanding of how my brain works, my neurobiology, how I relate to people, what are my struggles, how can I support myself, how can I ask for help, what should I probably let go of, what should I ask for more of, what should I work towards. We can't make those decisions without understanding ourselves and understanding what we need. Does anybody have any questions before I wrap up? Thank you, Ali. That's really kind. It's nice to hear you talking about this. I'm 55, autistic, and still don't have a friend group I fit into, so I stopped trying and I just don't have friends. I totally understand that, Christine. As sometimes it's about self-preservation too. You know, there's a lot of information uh, pushed on to parents. So much importance placed on social networks for autistic children. We, so, we do work that stuff out in our own time when we're given the space and the freedom to do so. Um, and sometimes we can feel bombarded by the sense of urgency and desperation to have friends and it becomes a demand and it feels too hard and it feels overwhelming. So we just disengage. My son knows he is different compared to his peers, which upsets and frustrates him. 
He hates to think that he is different. I've had him assessed for autism, but they said he did not meet criteria. How? I have no idea how he didn't. I did have it said to me that to his detriment, I am a developmental educator and have raised him that way. I also discuss autism in a positive light. I also talk about our friends who are autistic, which surprises him when he realises who are autistic. Mm. But funnily enough, he is happy and comfortable around them. Wonder why. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, a lot of people will say, oh, I always just had this knack for knowing when people were autistic, or I always just felt really comfortable with autistic people. <laughs> there might be a reason for that. Um, and I want to say this, just because a child is assessed and told they're not autistic doesn't mean they're not, that they're not autistic. You know, somebody who isn't autistic has designed a checklist of criteria that I, I was just talking about this in a consultation that we check off. Now, some of us have learned very well how to mask and how to pretend that we're exactly like everybody else. And it's both a conscious and an unconscious process. When I first went in to be assessed, I didn't even know that I was still looking for what was the right answer. I didn't answer honestly. You know, I lost sight of the fact that I was in there being assessed for autism. And so when I was asked specific interview questions, then I would panic about not knowing whether there was a right and a wrong answer or whether it was completely open to answer. I needed more information. And that alone probably contributed to my diagnosis. But I didn't sit there and answer honestly because sometimes we don't know what the honest answer is because we mask. Do you recommend any specific YouTube channels, sources, which my 10 year old son could explore, observe before we tell him his diagnosis? Yes. Hi, Natalie. Yes, absolutely. Um, I will in the comment section of this later on today, add some that I know of. Uh, I know some for children with a PDA profile, but they're autistic. Uh, but there are plenty of YouTube channels of autistic children sharing their experience, particularly one recently um, that their mum has reached out and chatted to me about. Yeah, it's a really good idea to just allow our children to observe other peers and see what they say and how they talk about autism because they'll quietly and secretly relate. They may not let us know and asking them, they're probably going to say, I don't know, or no, or I don't want to talk about it, or oh, are we talking about this again? They're just some of the things my children say to me. <laughs> but the important thing, yes, Autism Explained is fabulous, um, is that they're exposed to autistic peers. Okay, I'm just going to do a double check and make sure I haven't missed anything. Melanie says, my son is so sad about his ADHD diagnosis and wishes it would go away because of how he feels about this. I'm hesitant to tell him now about his autism diagnosis. Yeah, and it can be difficult when we're young, Melanie, because especially when we are um, neurodivergent, it's threatening. It's a huge threat to us to be different from our peers because we know who's targeted and who's bullied. And it's usually people who are different. So we try so hard and we want so desperately to be like everybody else. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer to tap into the fact that actually being autistic and ADHD, I love being ADHD. I love like jumping around like a lunatic and driving everybody up the wall and having a million ideas at once. And sometimes I really hate it. Sometimes it's exhausting. But this is why it's so important to connect our children with peers who are also ADHD and autistic. Because then that feeling of difference 
will slowly not be such a big deal because there will be other people our age out there who we can relate to and will understand it's okay to be different. Actually, it's really cool. But if we're constantly only surrounded by children who don't share our neurotype, then of course we're going to feel like it's unacceptable. Okay. That's it. Do, 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 do. Boom. That was brought to you by ADHD. Okay. Have a wonderful day, everybody. And for those of you that will be joining me for the webinar tonight on PDA partnerships, I look forward to connecting with you again. Bye-bye.